Welcome everybody to a very special edition of Radical Health Radio, the first edition. I'm going to be explaining to you who I am, why we're doing it, what is Radical Health Radio. I'm going to be introducing our seven steps to radical health, and we're going to be uncovering a lot together as we embark on this journey to radical health, a thing that we believe is your birthright. So before we get going, I just kind of wanted to set the scene. You know, there's a lot of podcasts in this health space. So why are we poking our nose in? Why are we adding noise to an already very noisy environment? Well, it's because we believe we can offer something different, something unique, something that maybe is a little more actionable and tangible. You see, the health space has many bright minds and those minds present a lot of incredible information. But information just stays at the level of the head unless we can do something with it. There's this trope in our culture that knowledge is power. And I would challenge that and say that knowledge is potential. It only becomes powerful when it's applied. And something we want to do with Radical Health Radio is present you with amazing ideas, knowledge, ancient wisdom from modern times, actionable information, bring on guests, challenge dogma, question your beliefs, my beliefs, the world beliefs, but also make it practical. If it's not practical and it just sits at the level of the head, then we can't impact change. And what we really want to do is be change makers. And the only way that we can be change makers if we give you the information in a digestible way that empowers you to be a change maker in your life, to implement on what it is that we are giving you and equipping you with. So to phrase all of that, we've kind of got to understand where we're at in our picture of health. Like, where are we right now? Because on one hand, we've got it as good as we have ever had it. We have more access to information. We have more access to food. We have more material wealth than ever before. And on paper, culture tells us, well, that means we should be the happiest we've ever been, right? But there's this thing that's happening, which seems that we're in the midst of a growing health crisis, not just physical, but also spiritual, emotional, mental, that we are the sickest we've potentially ever been, that we're very divided right now. We're very angry. We're very anxious. We're kind of lost, you know, and there's cost to that, to society that is very pragmatic. It's costing our healthcare industry billions of dollars, billions of dollars. It's costing you and your employers and everybody in the workforce hours of lost productivity. It's also costing us passion. It's costing us our relationships. It's costing us joy. It's costing us the one thing that everybody wants deep down, which is happiness. And we believe that the key back to that, the key that unlocks all of this, or at the very least is the foot in the door to start reclaiming that is health, but not just a little bit of health, radical health, like holistic radical health, health of body, health of mind, health of heart, health of soul, health of vision, health of community and relationships. So the goals for doing this podcast is really to bring solutions to a table full of problems. We have our problems. We can't deny it any longer, but we're not here to be pessimists. We're not here to say, oh my God, what are we going to do? The world's ending. We're here to say that we can be change makers. And this change that we're talking about is a grassroots movement. It's not going to come from any top-down system. It's not going to come from any institution. It's going to come from education. It's going to come from community. It's going to come from you being the change that you wish to see in the world. That's why we're here. That's why we want to carve our voice in this space. We want to bring you on a journey with us. And one of our core commitments and values is to be collaborative in that. So something that's very, very exciting about Radical Health Radio is we're bringing you along for the journey. I mean, quite literally, we're bringing you onto the show. We are going to have callers call in to each episode with questions. And they're going to get to ask questions live on air. They're going to riff with me and our special guests that we bring in along the way to receive, again, that actionable, individualized, specific information that pertains to their health journey. That spans a wide range of topics that we build into the framework of our seven steps to radical health. So when I say we're listening to you, I mean it. We're really listening to you. We know that we can't do this without you. It takes two to tango. So as I sit here presenting this information, I'm also inviting you into this process with us. Let us know what you need. Let us know how we can help you. Let us know how we can strengthen and build this community. And let's do it together. 
so we can create change, so that we can create ripples in our lives and the lives and the future of our world and our families and everybody in it. So, who am I? Why am I here? How can I help you? How can I help this community? It's a very good question, and I'm glad you asked it, or I asked it myself. <laughs> My name is Stee. It's not that cool. It's just short for Stephen, actually. An interesting little fact is in the northwest of England, we don't do Steve, we do Stee. So that's all that's about. But that's where my story really starts, you know, 33 years ago in the northwest of England, in a pretty dreary, gray, working class town. I'm proud of where I came from, but I'm prouder of where I am going. And my story really starts as one of desperation becoming my motivation is about the best way I can put it. My pain becoming my purpose and my ill health becoming my radical health of which I want to share with you now. I had, like many of you, I imagine, not the best health growing up. I was riddled with all kinds of niggling little issues from chronic headaches to uh, bouts of psoriasis on my scalp and elbows to also just this reoccurring theme throughout my childhood that we had the fat gene. Um, there is a very palpable memories in my household of my mom either being elated with joy because she won the slimmer of the week at Weight Watchers or borderline depressed because she didn't lose much and confining herself to restrictive dieting methods, meal replacement shakes, and a terrible relationship with food and her body, which got imparted onto me. I was never a fit kid. I was ne never particularly healthy. I was often chubby, soft around the edges, and very self-conscious. You know what I'm talking about, the you know lack of confidence to take your shirt off around a swimming pool, and just never really was steered in the right direction as most of us weren't, because our parents were doing the best that they could with the tools that they had, right? About education around what it means to eat healthy, and a bit of education around you know loving your body, accepting it, and being committed to also improving it at the same time, because those things can coexist. So my story started to evolve, especially as I got into my teenage years, where I started to see family members pass away long before the time from complications from chronic illnesses. Illnesses and diseases that I now know we can slow down, if not put into remission with diet and lifestyle changes. And there's always a part of me that wonders what if, right? What if I could have just got in then? What if they could have learned the stuff that we're gonna uncover together? Maybe they'd still be here. And that's a lot of what ifs and that can get painful and desperate. So now you turn that into a purpose of helping other people avoid those same pitfalls. So as I'm evolving on my journey and knowing full well that I, I'm not particularly healthy and not feeling particularly good about that, and also feeling a little bit like that's not fair. Like, why am I the chubby kid? Why am I not very athletic? One thing led to another and I stumbled across a podcast funnily enough. Um, and it was a podcast that changed my entire life. And it's a very full circle moment for me here to be sitting in the seat of presenting a podcast that's hopefully going to reach thousands, if not millions of lives, and potentially be the catalyst that could change your life too. Because it literally was this podcast that changed my life. I remember I was desperate. I was 16 years old. I was seeking information. I was questioning this idea that your genetics are it for you. You know, this is the hand you were dealt. Tough luck. We have the fat gene. Our family has a history of cancer and heart disease. You're in trouble. And then I heard this line that your genes may load the gun, but your environment pulls the trigger. And you're in control of your environment. And that doesn't just mean your environment where you live. And it means how you're cultivating your environment. How do you feed yourself? How are you thinking? How are you moving? How are you getting outside and playing? How is your level of stress? And that podcast changed it all for me because it blew my mind wide open. It forced me to question a fundamental belief I had about the world and my health and future in it. All of a sudden, there was a infinite possibilities open to me. Maybe I could reclaim my health. Maybe I wasn't gonna be this way forever. Maybe we did have the fat gene, but maybe it didn't matter because the only way that manifests is true is if you provide the environment for that to flourish. All of a sudden, I turned from a desperate, kind of angry kid with a chip on my shoulder to a hopeful young adult who was looking forward to taking his health in his own hands, becoming responsible for it all, and knowing that there's this whole new world of information that's opening up to me. And that was it. I was bitten by the bug. I was consuming anything and everything that I could. 
By the age of 17, 18, I was going to university in England, studying sports therapy and learning all about physiology and the kinesiology of the body, the muscles and how the body works. And that was kind of my first entryway. It was a lot about the body and how to move it. And I started to lose some weight and I started to move a little bit better. And one thing led to another and this snowball effect of now understanding that what you put in your mouth really dictates how you feel. And it really dictates how you look. And removing certain foods from my diet immediately. I remember the number one thing that I did that got me into this way of life was removing gluten-containing grains. And within a matter of days, feeling a massive increase in the level of pain and inflammation in my knees. And my gut issues started to subside. And my skin improved. And at that point, I was in for the long haul. I wanted to know anything and everything. And if you're here and you're at day one, then this is your invitation to start. You might be here and you're pretty deep on this path already. And you know that it just keeps going deeper and deeper the more you pull on that thread. So I'm starting to empower myself with this information, get healthy, feel better, teach other people how to do it because naturally you just want to give back when you're finding health. I always was drawn naturally to giving back and teaching. And that's probably the reason why I'm sitting in this seat today. But along the way, I was also questioning who I was as a person, who I was as a man, where I was gonna go, what I was gonna do with all of this. And I didn't know. I had a, an athletic career on the side that the part of me inside the boy wanted to be a professional rugby player that's what i wanted more than anything else and i didn't quite make the cut come 18 19 years old when the contracts were handed out and that was pretty soul crushing for me it left me a little bit hopeless and despondent but also with a lot of athletic energy to channel into something else and that something else just happened to be martial arts i'm very competitive by nature i like to challenge myself i like to challenge myself against others and push the limits of the body and of the mind which resulted in, you know, a three or four year stint into the world of mixed martial arts, where I did learn a lot about myself. You will confront a lot of your own demons when you lock yourself inside a cage with another human being, and it's just you, the referee, and that other person. And I learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned is that fighting wasn't really for me. I'm more of a lover, not a fighter. Although I was good at fighting, I realized I was trying to prove a point to the world. I was trying to make up for this pain that I didn't quite get over of not making it as a professional. I was trying to show the world that I, I, I could be something and, and I should be accepted and I could be proud, but it was never really my path. But the other thing that it taught me a lot of was again, understanding the mind, understanding the body, understanding diet, cutting weights for competitions, the ramifications of doing that, the bad relationship with food that it forced me to develop because of very restrictive states of eating and having to come full circle on what all that means for sustainable long-term health. So in my meandering lostness of wondering what I should do and where I should go in this life, I happened to take a little rain check on life and decide I was going to go do a summer camp in America as an English boy to experience what that might be like. And lo and behold, a couple of summers after that, I met my wife there. Um, she was not my wife at the time, of course. In 2013, we met and we went on this beautiful adventure together of traveling um, for four years into far reaching parts of the world, mostly going to the east traveling in Thailand and Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam. And what was really fascinating about going on that journey was it showed me and challenged me to think about how I define success in the world. I come from the developed West where success is material goods and status. Meanwhile, I was in these other far reaching parts of the world where material success wasn't that common at all, but people seemed abundantly happy and they seemed healthy. And that was kind of a, a light bulb moment for me that maybe what we think of as success isn't the be all and end all. And it's okay to have those things, but something else is missing. And it's this sense of community and purpose and connection to the land and eating an ancestrally appropriate diet. Throughout this entire experience of these four years of removing myself from life, I was still consuming materials like crazy. It's lots of bus rides, lots of planes, lots of trains and automobiles. Every podcast I could get my hand on, every book, online certifications, you name it, I was digesting it all. And it became very apparent to me that in these cultures where islands were still eating the native diets, there was abundant health and a lack of what we'd call modern Western diseases. Whereas in the cities where these Western foods had snuck their way in, Coca-Cola, corn, um, you know, based snacks, um, seed oils, refined sugars, all of the classic stuff that is so pervasive in our food culture right now, obesity and Ill, Ill health was exploding. And that was another light bulb moment that kind of brought this all together. I didn't know where I was going still, but I knew how to get there. And I knew how to get there was something to do with giving this mission of health back. So on one fateful evening in Costa Rica around 2018, 
I had a divine download that I should be a health coach. I should help people on their path. I should help people learn the things that I've been learning on how to implement that in their life. Health had given me the best gift imaginable. It had given me a fullness and a richness to life that I'd never known before. My relationship was thriving and I loved life. I was happy, genuinely, for a long time of not being that happy. And I wanted to give that back because it's the best gift you can give anybody. I truly knew then that health is wealth. Now I just had to figure out how to give it back. So that's launched my coaching career. It's been growing ever since then. I'm about five years into helping people reclaim their health. And this is the next step on that journey to sit in this seat and to be able to spread this message, to bring experts around this table, to invite you into this process, to find your radical health and to continue to grow together, evolve together, get healthier together and kick some butt along the way. So I hope you're ready to go on this journey with me. I know I am. I'm very excited for what's to come. Thank you for being here. We're only going to get bigger. We're only going to get better. We're only going to get healthier together. So with all of that said, how do we do it? Well, that's what we're really here for today. And I'm very excited to unveil to you what we are calling our seven steps to radical health. Remember, that's why we're here, right? We want to get you radically healthy. We want to provide you with a framework that meets everybody where they're at. So let's dive in, shall we? Step number one is to eat organs daily. Yes, that right, to get your organ meats in the diet. Why? Well, they are the most nutrient dense foods on the planet in the most bioavailable form. You will often hear terms like superfood, or you might've even been on a multivitamin in the past. We think these are nature's multivitamins. We know this from nutrient analysis, what's available in organs can help with our rampant problem of nutritional inadequacies across the board as a consequence of our modernized food system. Many, many people are suffering from a low vibrancy state, a low health state. And we know that at the root cause of a lot of that lies nutrient deficiencies. This can lead to all kinds of chronic long-term health problems. And we wanted an easy, tangible win right off the bat that can help you feel good immediately. We believe organs do just that. It's a very high quality information. And food is information. Information that you're providing to the system to upgrade or downgrade your biological systems. Organs are an amazing food, prized by our ancestors since antiquity. And they've kind of been forgotten about in our modern food structure. And we want to put them back on the pedestal that they belong. And we want you to get them however you can get them. So if you're open to the idea of picking up some liver and maybe grinding a little bit of that up and putting it in a burger, amazing. Maybe that is not your thing right now and you're not ready for it. And that's why we've created amazing supplements. So you can have all of the convenience, all of the nutritional bang for your buck with none of the flavor, none of the cooking, but still getting those nutrient dense foods into your diet. That's why organs are king. That's why we've put them in as step one. And this will give you the energy and momentum to bring into step two. Step two, eliminate processed foods. This is a big one because processed foods are everywhere. In fact, they make up about 70% of the average American diet, which is pretty crazy. Most of the food that we're eating is processed or highly processed foods. And why are these a problem? Well, to be quite frank, they don't really come from nature. They're man-made. And we want to honor nature as much as possible because nature knows. Nature provides health and abundance. Factories, not so much so. Processed foods are often a combination of the most highly inflammatory food substances of our time. We've got refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup, seed oils, gluten containing grains. And in packaged food, they usually come as an entourage, perfectly packaged to drive up your inflammation, cause rampant oxidative stress, keep you very hungry, keep you very sick and in a low energy state. So a big problem with these processed foods is that they're hyper palatable. We've all been there. We've all taken down the family size bag of chips. We know that once you pop, you can't stop. We know that we bet you can not eat just one because there are people with very real big salaries designed to make these foods taste that way. They're a perfect combination of sugar and fat that lights the brain on fire and just makes you want to go in on those. So they're hyper palatable. They're very hard to practice any semblance of moderation around but they're also a combination of highly problematic foods. 
in particular seed oils. These seed oils are very pervasive in our culture. They are things like canola, corn, safflower, soybean oil. They're very easily oxidized. They're a polyunsaturated fatty acid that is rich in linoleic acid, which oxidizes quite easily in the presence of heat, light, and oxygen, which is a problem because that means in the manufacturing, extraction, cooking, and eating process, there is ample opportunities for these fats to become oxidized. Once inside the body, this causes a rampant cascade of oxidation and inflammation. It disrupts your gut microbiome function, your vitality, your health, your mitochondrial activity, your literal power plants of producing energy get dampened by the consumption of this food. And then we've got our gluten containing grains. We've got our breads, our flours, our pastas, our cookies, things that disrupt the gut microbiome again, keeping you locked in a state of high inflammation that potentially over time can lead to things like autoimmune disease because your immune system is constantly on high alert. The gut becomes leaky. We stop absorbing things from our food like we could. So even if we're getting some good stuff with our sandwich, how much of that are we absorbing? And how much damage are we doing as a result of including these foods in our diet? So as we add in the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet with organs, we're simultaneously trying to take away the most problematic foods in our culture, which are these highly processed foods. And we're prioritizing the foods that come from nature. We're eating real food. Remember, nature doesn't make that many mistakes. Factories create a lot of problems. And that's why if we just eat real food, we're getting a very good amount of the way there. So our overindulgence in these processed foods is quite clearly contributing to our insidious health decline. It's leading to diabetes and rampant obesity, nutrient deficiencies, inflammation. More than anything, it's just robbing us of our vitality. And we can achieve radical health with processed foods in the diet. So let's talk about some tangible swaps right off the bat and some of the biggest culprits to watch out for. Of course, we just talked about seed oils. We want to be swapping out those for fats that come from nature. Ideally, animal fats, things like well-sourced butter, ghee, lard, tallow. We also want to be opting for the plant oils that are not so high in this omega-6 linoleic acid. Things like a good quality olive oil or coconut oil or avocado oil. These are much better options. They come from nature. And remember, nature knows. We also want to do our best to limit the consumption of refined sugar in our diets, as well as high fructose corn syrup. These things are not your friend, but we're not anti-sugar here. We actually like sugar that comes from nature in the form of nature's offering, fruit honey, maple syrup. These are our friends on animal-based diet. And we're deprioritizing refined sugar as well as artificial sweeteners that can be problematic for the health of our gut microbiome. And these hide everywhere. So be aware, look at labels and start to practice a little bit more diligence around what you are putting in your mouth. Remember to shop the peripheries of the grocery store. That's where you'll find most of the real food. Almost everything else in the middle is this highly processed food that's leading to all of these problems and contributing to our ill health. If we are gonna get radically healthy, then we need to start eating real food and that means we need to eliminate processed foods. Step three is to establish a healthy routine. This is all about habits. I like to say that people don't decide their futures, they decide their habits and their habits decide their futures. And we really wanna empower you with understanding that. The habits are really a reflection of your identity and that it's malleable and we can change our habits and we can actually build habits into this healthy routine that become the compound interest of your self-improvement. Think about these little health investments that you're making every single day that your future you is going to be thanking you for. And we could get all over the map in this. I wanna focus on some tangible, suggestible strategies that you can take and implement. So think about routines. Humans thrive in healthy routines. And some of the best routines you can start to develop are things like a solid morning routine. If you just reflect for a moment, I'm sure many of us are guilty of starting the day in a very reactive state. We, the alarm blurs, it wakes us up, we rush for the coffee, we've got five minutes to get out of the house and it's go, go, go and hustle, hustle, hustle. But we've got to remember that that kind of sets the tone for the day. We're very reactive and we're not very grounded. So maybe a morning routine that carves out time for a little bit of stillness and habit stacking is something that we really want to focus on. If we're going to implement a healthy routine, how can we enhance it by stacking it with other health promoting behaviors? So in this morning routine, maybe you get outside a little bit, get natural light on your face and on your skin so you can lock in your circadian clock and signal that for a good night of sleep. Maybe you practice some breath work, 
Maybe you get your bare feet on the grass and ground yourself. Maybe you just take time to hydrate before you caffeinate, to really ground yourself before rushing into this day and looking for all the problems that will inevitably be waiting for you when you arrive anyway. What about a nighttime routine? What are you doing up until the moment you try to sleep, right? We understand that sleep is so important for our version of radical health. We need to be getting good quality sleep in a cold, dark room. And so many people are blasting themselves with artificial light right up until the moment that they wanna go to bed. And then they think that maybe they're sleeping okay, when in reality, they're passing out from exhaustion. They're not getting through the full cycles of sleep. It's not restful. They're not accessing those deep restorative states of REM because the environmental mismatch of artificial light, eating too late at night, et cetera, et cetera. Another thing we want you to be very aware of is avoiding the stillness factor that is inbuilt into modern life. So many of us just don't move that much. And that's very at odds with our evolutionary adaptations, where we were moving, walking, getting outside, bending, playing, and doing all kinds of movement throughout our day. Most of us now move from the kitchen to our car, to go and sit in the office, to get back in the car, to go and sit in our couch, to go to our bed. There's not a lot of organic movement in there. I want you to be very intentional about thinking how you can take movement snacks throughout your day. And here we come back to this idea of habit stacking. Go for a walk. Go outside, take your shoes off, listen to an audio book, call a loved one while you do this, but make it a conscious effort in your life to avoid this stillness. If you observe nature, things that don't move start to atrophy. They're stuck in place, they start to wither and die, and movement is life. So keep that in your routine, figure out how you're gonna do it, use alarms, put it in your calendar, time block time for movement and to avoid the stillness factor. And the last suggestion I wanna make for you is to think about ways you can effectively manage and mitigate stress in your life. It's no secret to any of us that modern life is quite stressful. It's wonderful, but it is stressful. And stress is not really an environment where we thrive. Physiologically speaking, our metabolisms don't do well when they're under a lot of stress. Mentally speaking, I don't know about you, but I know that most of us don't do well when we're under a lot of stress. Here's the thing about being a human. It's going to be stressful. We have to kind of acknowledge that state and we become better at handling stress. Think of stress almost like the waves on the ocean. They might get really big sometimes, but you can learn to surf better. If you never learn to surf those waves, you just get banged over the head every time and bashed against the coral reef. So you need to implement consciously stress management techniques into your life. And these can look very varied and very wide ranging for the individual. They can be anything from a self-reflective practice. You could sit, you could create an external mind by journaling every day. You could breathe, you could meditate, you could get in sunlight, you could play with a loved one, you could carve out conscious connection time with your partner after dinner to ask how was your day and keep that space sacred. You could also practice saying no more because when you say yes to something, you're saying yes to all that comes with it. When your calendar is full and you're saying yes to everything and yes to all of these events and all of these obligations, who is saying yes for you? So we need to strike that balance there. We need to find a balance between what we're giving of ourselves and how we're pouring back into our own cup because nobody can give from an empty cup. And in my experience, many people are trying to just give and give and give and give and nobody's giving back to them because the only person that can give back to you is you. So think about what you're saying yes to that maybe you could be saying no to and think about how you're gonna restore balance into your life through these healthy routines. So step number four, it's time to dial in the diet. So here we're taking things to the next step. We've built a lot of momentum so far. We've added in the most nutrient dense foods on the planet in the form of organs and we've eliminated the most objectionable foods, which is processed foods. And now we're left in this place of cool. Well, how do we really structure this optimal human diet so we can reclaim our radical health? And this is where we really get to experiment. We get to find out where your needs are nutritionally and how to tweak that and dial it in. But we have the framework and the framework is again provided by nature and it's built on animals, animal-based products, fruit, honey, maple syrup, raw dairy, if those encapsulate the entirety or the vast majority of the foods that you eat, it's only a matter of time before radical health finds you. Now, where do we go on that? And what are some of the parameters? 
We suggest aiming from anywhere from 0.8 to 1 gram per pound of body weight in protein per day. We, elim uh, we eliminate the remaining most toxic food substances, which is the surprising idea for some people. But plants are not always your friend. Some plants come with high amounts of anti-nutrients like phytic acid or lectins or oxalates, for example. And it's time to identify those and remove them for the, from the diet so we can truly thrive to get rid of foods that we know contain these and are often lauded as healthy foods in our culture. Things like nuts and seeds and dark leafy greens. They might not be the friend that you think they are and it's time to remove them to see how your body responds without them as you prioritize animal-based nutrition in its place. It's also at this point time to look at things like organic versus non-organic. And if you have the option to do that, the available resources to do that, to vote with your dollar, to buy organic, to opt for the raw dairy over the conventional dairy if you have access to it, to go for the grass-fed and grass-finished meats if you have the avail availability to do that. It is in this step where we really want to think about if eating out is a part of our lives, how do we navigate menus at a restaurant with a little more intentionality? It might be as simple as asking them, can they cook your steak in butter? And if that's not a possibility, can they use no oil at all? Maybe you're stuck with a poor option for lunch, but you can still get a burger and throw the bun away and have some salt and double up the protein. There are ways of thinking about this and being more intentional about it, but it requires awareness. It requires that you understand these steps and look for all of the ways that these sneaky foods are making it back into your routine and take the steps necessary to protect yourself and your health from them. Maybe in this dial-in phase, we're looking at other things in our diet. We're maybe assessing our relationship with alcohol, for example. Not that you have to remove alcohol, but maybe it would be interesting to try life without it for a span of days to see how it's affecting you, how it might be affecting your sleep, how it might be making you hungrier the following day and actually making it harder for you to make these smart choices around food because your stress hormones are elevated and you're hungrier than you would be without them. So step number four is the big experiment step. It's turning yourself into the lab rat. It's really pulling on different le levers, dialing things up, dialing certain things back, going without certain things for a span of time and experimenting and now really listening to the body. The body speaks, the body is very intelligent. If you start to develop this relationship with it, you'll quickly see that the food that you're putting in your mouth and the environment that you're curating, the habits that you're building very much dictates how you feel, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally too. So as we dial in, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for affirmations and confirmations from our body. Yes, I like it when you eat that way. I feel great. I'm waking up with energy. Maybe I don't need that afternoon cup of coffee anymore. I'm not so stressed that I need the glass of wine every night. I'm sleeping better. I'm looking better. I'm feeling better. Step four is all about dialing it in so you can start really making strides towards your radical health. Step number five is push yourself physically. So now we're getting into the movement realms, the exercise realms, what we do to stay fit and build fitness. Functional fitness. And I know that term gets thrown around quite a lot, but what does it actually mean? Well, we define it as building the fitness and the movement capacity to do the kinds of movement that life demands of you. And this is things like squatting, lunging, walking, running, pushing, pulling. These are the movements of life. These are the movements that you will find yourself doing repeatedly. And we need to build a certain capacity to do these under load with quality. But like all things in life, the dose usually makes the poison. And the myth of more is better in our culture is one that is very much alive and well in the fitness and movement space. If one exercise session a week is good, two is better, three is better still, seven is king. Well, that's what we're here to push against because we've already established that life can be very stressful for modern humans. And exercise is a stressor. There's no doubt about it. Now it can be a wonderful stressor in the appropriate doses at the appropriate time, fueled by the appropriate diet with enough rest and recovery in between. But we want to basically build a nice diverse movement portfolio with the ability to move slow at a frequent pace, a lot. 
daily walks, rucking, those kinds of things. We also want to every once in a while really turn it up and run like our lives depend on it. Sprint once in a while, maybe a couple times a month, once a week, you challenge yourself, you take to the hills, you run fast, you move fast. If movement, movement limitations stop you from pounding the pavement, then you can do that on a bike or a rowing machine. There's many ways to get creative with your movement and we want to build strength. Strength is king, strength is useful, and strength builds the longevity organ that we call muscle. Muscle is a glucose sink, it's protective for our skeletons, it raises our basal metabolic rate and allows us to burn more calories, creating a healthier metabolic state. But there's a way in which we've gotta go about doing all of this that is balanced, that is not about redlining our bodies all the time, too often and too frequently, because we will just cause a dysregulation in the body. We'll become hypercortisolemic. We'll potentially set ourselves up for crashing and burning. We could potentially injure ourselves in that process and then find ourselves not moving at all because we bit the bug of more is better. So balance, nuance, move frequently at a slow pace, turn it up and get after it and be a savage every once in a while and dedicate your strength practices to developing propensity in the human movements. Can you push? Can you pull? Can you squat? Can you lunge? Can you stand on one leg? Can you change directions relatively quickly to become more of an athlete for life, but not necessarily for the sports field? You don't need to go to the gym to do this either. The body is quite a heavy thing. You can do push-ups, you can do squats, you can lunge around the block. If it's your thing to go to the gym and throw the iron around, then go do that too. But make sure that in everything that we do in the animal-based approach and our seven steps to radical health, that we're prioritizing balance. We're prioritizing abundance by not being overstressed, hypercortisolemic, and pushing too hard, too fast, because that will slow us down in the long run when we crash and burn. Sustainability and consistency is king or queen, and we're only gonna get there if we do it in a balanced way. Step six, it's time to level up. So in this step, we are looking at various ways of leveling up, whether we are talking about utilizing certain hormetic stresses to cause a adaptive response that's beneficial, for scanning our environments and potentially looking for lingering environmental toxins, to again, reflecting on this entire process and basically saying, how do I level up holistically across the board? So to give you a few tangible items here, you might be looking at some heat exposure, for example. These intermittent bouts of high heat exposure, like in a sauna, causes an adaptive stress response. So we have to be careful here of doing too much of this again. It's kind of a similar story to the move yourself physically. Stress is stress is stress. And if you're incredibly overburdened with stress and your work life is hectic and you're not sleeping that well and you haven't done the previous five steps of dialing in all of that, then we don't go to the cold plunges and we don't go to the saunas right away because we want to build up that grounded energy in the body. We want to create that resilience and then expose ourselves to our edges. So these stresses can be very beneficial and adaptive in appropriate doses again. But is it for everybody to cold plunge every day and sauna every day and CrossFit every day, et cetera, et cetera? No, because the dose makes the poison. This is where you have to listen to your body again. These can be incredibly adaptive tools. We know there are very well-documented health benefits from things like heat exposure, getting in the sauna, from a detoxing pathway of sweating, from heat shock proteins and the adaptive responses at the level of the mind, to the cold which is to force yourself to do something that basically nobody likes, like getting in a cold plunge. But this thermic effect of the metabolic adaptations and the effect of browning your fat so that you can stay warmer at colder temperatures for longer and potentially raise your basal metabolic rate again. There's no doubt that these tools have their place and they can be incredibly health promoting behaviors. But again, we have to be careful if we're redlining it too much. So we can shelve that conversation there and now look at other ways we can level up, maybe in our home for example. And this is a big one that often goes undercover because people just aren't aware of it. Things like what are the scents and fragrances in your home or on your skin? 
So many people use the plugins that, that, that you know, cast this spell into the air the whole time. So a lot of people put lotions on their skin that are full of endocrine disrupting chemicals. A lot of people are using colognes. What about the water that you are showering in? What about the water that you are drinking? What about your home? What about if you live in a humid environment like Florida, the potential overexposures to mold? This arena, you can see, gets very wide very, very quickly, and there is a lot to potentially entertain and think about. Now, this isn't said to overwhelm you or to scur you that everything is out to get you, but to plant the seed that once you start to look for these toxins, these environmental stresses, and look to level up, you will see that there is a good amount of low-hanging fruit behaviors that you could do that go a long way. From things like stop drinking water out of plastic bottles to be exposed to microplastics, stop um, putting your leftover food into Pyrexes and heating them up in the microwave and leaching, again, microplastics into your food. Try to get a good quality water filter instead of drinking the municipal water supply. If you want to take that a step further, entertain the idea of making a showerhead filter to you know, uh, help clean the water that you're bathing and washing in. There are many, many things that you can do to look to level up. This step is all about becoming a detective and really taking out the fine tooth comb and the looking glass to find where you can kind of tie off these loose ends because these loose ends, whilst they're not the bulk of what we do, not the bulk of our focus, it might be the thing that is at the end that's going to take you from that 80 to 90% and that 90% to 100% of radical health. So level up, use hormetic stresses, tweak, dial up, and also look for environmental stresses in the home and be cautious of what you're consuming, putting on your skin and the choices that you're making. Step seven, last but certainly not least, is all about achieving your why. Why are we doing this? What are we gonna do with this radical health? What we got so far, what's next? This is the step that ties it all together. This is where we take our radical health that we've accumulated through the previous six steps and actualize our radical self to become quite literally the best version of ourselves, whatever that means for you. Because radical cannot be defined. It means to you what it means to you. Radical health means different things to different people. For some, that's launching a business that changes the world. For others, that's being the best father or mother that they could possibly be. For some, it's just pushing themselves to see what they're capable of in this life, working through their limits, smashing through these brick walls of perceived limitations, becoming who they might be, leaving behind the self-doubts, the insecurities, the anxieties, the self-imposed limits. Who might you be if you were all that you could be? This is the step that it's really all about. This is why we're doing it. Because we want to be rich in the currency of happiness. We want to be aligned. We want to know and feel healthy. We want to be able to give back to our communities, leave people better than we found them, be a change maker in this world. And we want to have some fun along the way. And this is your vehicle for life. And the healthier it is, the more experiences you can have, the more experiences you can have, the more you will learn, the more wisdom you will acquire, the more fun you'll have along the way. Life is meant to be lived and enjoyed. And we're convinced that you can live it and enjoy it exponentially more when you get exponentially healthier. And we can do that if we use these seven steps, if we understand that day by day we're investing in our self-improvement, we're slowly becoming who we might be, we're actualizing our radical self, we're taking little steps that are gonna produce radical results then that's what we get to have at the end of it. The day you plant the seed is not the day you eat the fruit, but it is coming. And if you work on this framework and you build momentum and you keep putting in those daily deposits for your future self, your future self will thank you. The world will thank you. You'll be healthy. You'll be vibrant. You'll be radical. So that's what we do. That's why we're here. That's where we're going. I'm very excited to share this journey with you. So there we have it, friends, the seven steps to radical health, a simple but not easy framework to implement, simple in the fact that the actionable items are there and we take it one step at a time and we just build and we build. And if you stay with this for the long haul, then your radical health is just a formality. Time will take care of the rest. So step number one, 
consume organs daily. Get on that organ train. Get those nutrient-dense foods into your diet. Step number two, eliminate the processed foods. Let's get those foods out of our diet that are robbing us of our health and vitality. Step number three, establish a healthy routine. Try to embody this idea that how you do one thing is how you do all things and that habits are really going to take you to your desired future desti destination. Step number four is to dial in your diet. So where you really start to run the experiment of self. Base your eating on an animal-based diet. Animals and animal-based products, fruit, honey, maple syrup, raw milk, you cannot go wrong with those foods. These are ancestrally and evolutionary appropriate and full of nutrition to help you thrive. Step number five, push yourself physically. Remember, this is your vehicle for life. The healthier that it is, the stronger that it is, the more mobile that it is, the better ride you can have on this life. But find balance. Remember not to overdo it, not to create too much stress, but to have fun moving in this meat suit. Step six is to level up. Go become the detective. Look for these little areas in your life that with a bit of effort will take you a long way. Leverage the hormetic stresses. Play with the elements of heat and cold. Find those toxins that you're putting on and in your body. Clean up your water. And last but not least, the one that ties it all together. Step number seven, achieve your why. Let this be a guiding principle. Let this be the vision that as you listen to this podcast, you plant that future seed. What is that why? Maybe you don't know yet, and that's okay. Because the goal is to get you clear on that, to equip you with health, which unlocks that whole vision. And if you follow these steps, that's where we're going. And we're going there together, which is why I'm closing this podcast with an ask of you, the audience. We need you. <laughs> we can't do this without you. We are going to have live callers in the show every single week asking questions and getting answered by our expert guests and myself. So please head over to Radical Health Radio if you'd like to be a part of that and submit your question online where a member of our team can reach out to you and get you on the show so we can start figuring this thing out together. We'll be posting weekly episodes on Wednesdays. We need your help. We'll be constantly calling you in to get you on the show. We're very excited to grow and learn together. And we'll see you next week. Bye-bye, fam. -bye,